well, those were, Alan, those were great days. Uh, to, for them to win three in a row, uh, to win in 1954, I remember as a kid in high school, I guess, Parker picking up the fumble and running it back. But uh, I think the third game against Montreal in 1956, when they beat them badly, that really showed who are the best in the CFL. That three in a row set what the Edmonton organization was all about, and that's continued on through the years. This is the greatest uh, organization in the CFL, bar none. But I remember Kwong the best. Kwong was the greatest guy for pulling stunts on people. And you know, one of the things he used to do, and this was mean, the style they had back in the old days when you were going to be cut, the coach or the trainer would come and take your stuff out of the locker. So when you walked in, your locker was empty and you made a turn and left. So Kwong used to, he would remove the stuff. And so when they came in, all the guys would know about it and they'd be heads down and the guy would walk up and oh my God, he would just be shook. And then when he was walking out the door, Kwong would say, no, no, we're just kidding. But this was, <laughs> this was a horrible thing. <laughs> well, I was married uh, in 1951, and my husband was from Edmonton, so I moved to Edmonton. Oh, it was a wonderful city. It wasn't very big. I don't remember how many people. I don't think there was 100,000 people in Edmonton when I first came. And in September, we went to my first football game. So they'd been going from the beginning, and I've been going since 1951. I had kids, and they sat in the knothole gang, and then uh, we would go to the um, director's club at, at halftime, and they had hot dogs and coffee, and it was terrific, and the kids would come in, and they'd have a hot dog, you know. Yeah, it was very sociable. It actually, the football games were our social life in those early years. The first thing they had was a speaker that uh, came down the middle of the field right by our bench uh, during the national anthem. So I was right beside a guy and he said, what the hell is that all about? So I said to him, welcome to the West. And cold, you wouldn't believe. So the, the one thing that is huge when it's that cold is that all your reflexes in terms of whether you're catching the ball, kicking it or blocking, everything kind of changes just a little bit. So your feel for the game, uh, you have to, the first team to get into the feel of the game is probably going to be the one that wins just because of the elements. Well, we are in nine out of 10 Grey Cups over 10 years. And the team consistently was changing. There was always people changing. We weren't the same team in the ninth year as we were in the first. But what, what, what did stay absolutely the same is that everybody went to the rhythm of our team. And if you came to our team, you had to understand what that rhythm was all about. And that rhythm wasn't about you. It was about everybody around you. If you could deal with that, then you'd be part of who we were. And one of the things that we used to call ourselves was the watch. And it's, it sounds kind of kind of hokey, but why we called ourselves the watch? Because you have no one piece in that watch that's more important than another, or you don't tell time. It didn't matter whether you were throwing touchdown passes, uh, whether you're taping ankles, or you're somebody that didn't get to play except on special teams. Everybody was exactly the same. The 77 Grey Cup, I remember on the plane on the way home, uh, just a conversation and we knew some things that happened in that game that that were very disappointing. But we knew we were better than what was on that field and we knew we were going to come back. And we learned about losing in 77 and we all decided that, that wasn't something we were happy with. So in 78 is when everyone, when they knew the true story, from that point forward, we were like, you know, we're going to beat the hell out of them every time we see them. That was our motivation from that point forward. That entire year was a year where we felt we had to redeem ourselves. We were determined, I think, that uh, that, that was the only goal that we were going to have, was to, to win that great cup. Well, I don't know, we went several years, maybe six or seven years without 
losing to Montreal again. We played in, in, in Toronto in that game against Montreal. And, uh, you know, they were, their, they were their returning champions. 78 game was a great game. It went back and forth. Uh, we turned the ball over way more than we should have. It went right down to the, basically the last minute before the game was secured by us, and we won by seven points. And once again, I go to my teammates and say that defensively, they won the game for us because they held them off the scoreboard. It was great. I thought, hey, I might get to stay another year. I'm, I'm as happy as the rookies were that first year in 78 because, I mean, obviously the first one is like anything. The first time you're in a, in a great cup, I mean, that was, that was awesome. And then afterwards, going to the Oiler hockey game and they made a big deal out of it. I, that's when I first started to realize how important it was to the city as a whole. Playing Montreal three times in a row, winning two out of three, that, that, that was uh, saying something for that team that we had back then. And even 79, when we played them again, it was like a best two out of three, right? We weren't gonna, it was, that's how I looked at it anyways. We weren't going to let them beat us. Uh, I think we redeemed ourselves after that first game. We, we were not a 41 to 10 losing kind of team. The, uh, that was the year we, we had the opportunity to tie the, uh, the ESPs of the 60s, or was it the 50s? The 50s, yeah. actually. Uh, talking to the players about the game individually and not so much about that we got to win three in a row. They were sitting here and enough of that in the media. You thought you know, always hoped you were good, and but there was always that high level to uh, aspire to. The players uh, definitely uh, made me understand how important that season was. Uh, wanting to, like you said, get that monkey off their back and do something special and uh, win that third one. That was certainly on everybody's mind. And, and you know, winning the third one was that she kind of took a deep uh, sigh of relief and okay, we matched them. And then it was just, well, what what could be done from that? It was a, a, a big deal. And of course it made the, the going for a fourth one bigger yet. You know, it was the time when Warren Moon was just kind of starting to really hit his rhythm. And, uh, you know, at the quarterback position, I think Hamilton was, uh, you know, pretty well outmatched. And what was really cool about that game was that Warren Warren started the game, but Wilkie finished the game. When Tom Wilkinson was the quarterback, I knew I was going to get a lot of touches. When Warren Moon was a quarterback, I knew I had a block. So I'm like, Warren made me a hungrier running back because I knew I wasn't going to get the ball that much. So when I did get it, I bet the score. And um, like you said, I, I was able to catch three touchdown passes, two from Warren and one from Wilkie. Yeah, it, it was a great game for Tommy. Uh, and, he, and he got shook up in that game early. He got he got rattled pretty good. I think I threw a pass, maybe my first or second pass of the game was kind of behind him and he took a big shot in the back and he had to go out of the game for a bit. But he came back like like nothing was bothering him. And like you said, had a great game. And You're catching everything to throw it to you because if I had dropped a couple of passes, Warren might not have stayed with me. Tommy um, caught three touchdowns. Important to everybody, but especially Tommy. He loved racking up touchdowns. And, you know, he, he always felt he was slighted by that guy named Tony Gabriel in Ottawa. Um, and I, I think when we were roommates on the road, and I think he used to swear about that guy in his sleep. He was like, you know, just felt... They always paid more attention to him, and Tommy never liked that. So catching three touchdowns in a great cup game was a wonderful day for Tommy. I got a chance to go against our defense a lot every day in practice, so I knew I didn't want to face them in a game. They just were stellar. Don Matthews had that group of guys. Individually, they were you know, great. Together, they were just incredibly formidable. And it was amazing, actually, watching them and those guys like Fennell and Dan Kepley. I mean, my God, who would have wanted to be hit by Dan Kepley? I, I certainly would not have. They were just so good and just really gave us a chance every game. And they turned the football over. I think they gave us four turnovers that day or something like that. One time I, when I did throw an interception, we got the ball right back because they knocked the ball out the quarterback's hands and we get the ball somewhere, I think, inside the 10 yard line and we end up scoring from there. So. They were just lights out that day and they weren't giving up anything. So that, that made it easy for us as an offense 
to do the things that we needed to do because our defense was so dominant that day. And you talk about everything going wrong you could think of. Yeah, that was that day. Because we were left for dead at halftime down, I think, 21 to 1. And Warren didn't have the kind of first half that he wanted. He, Huey pulled him in the start of the second quarter. And then Wilkie got us all settled down. It speaks to, uh, it speaks a lot to Warren. I mean, he was obviously at the top of his game. And, and Tom was, you know, that was his last game. Some teams, if you put in another quarterback, they go, oh my gosh, he gave up on his quarterback or something. And we, we knew what we were doing there as far as what our plan was. And that was to have uh, Wilkie go in and settle us down and, and just make a few first downs. He was coming off, he was walking off the field with Huey at halftime. And Huey told him he was going to be starting in the second half. And Wilkie, it was his last game. And he said, no, this is Warren's team now. And he's the one that's going to have to bring us back. Locker room was uh, serious, quiet. Yeah, we, we were confident at halftime, to tell you the truth. We, we knew we had laid an egg in that first half. Wilkie stood up on the bench and he said, uh, we, uh, we won X number of games this year. Sometimes we won them in the first half, sometime in the second. Let's go get them. That was his speech. Tom was not only led on the field that day, but also in the locker room. And it speaks volumes to Warren to be able to digest what was happening as opposed to being upset about it, using that time to see so that when he came back in and in the third quarter, you know, he was ready to go again, which he was. And that was one of the great things about th that team that we had that ability to do that, that we could all kind of look at each other at a, at a time in certain games and say, okay, it's time to, to get going because we're not playing well right now. And it seemed like we could get that engine going and, and uh, did whatever it took to, to, to get a win. And that's exactly what happened in that Grey Cup game. We would, we would go out every day and we would always, always kick six seconds to go into Grey Cup. Every practice we did, we'd do six seconds to go into Grey Cup. And I tell you what, we lost a lot of those games just by the practice. And when we ran out in the field in the last couple of, couple of seconds of the game, there was six seconds on the clock. Oh, man. It's gotten down to a kick? Oh, my God. I had more confidence in that guy than, I, you know, I don't know, probably anybody. I don't know why I had that confidence. I, I, in my mind, I don't think he ever missed a kick. And then to have what at that time was the best kicker in the world uh, to kick a field goal, um, you know, was I liked our chances. Watching the defensive linemen across from you, having all of their spirit broken as we came back <laughs> to win. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but that <laughs> is fun. We uh, kicked the ball. And the heat is on the holder. He's got it. No run back. That's a field goal. The Eskimos. Wilkie stood up, didn't say nice going or anything, and he said they fell right into our trap. <laughs> that was the end of the game. And Wilkie was the quarterback. And as a matter of fact, let me just say something about Wilkie. He is probably one of the, the best leaders I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, you know, he called me junior. And um, and he started calling me that from the day that I got there. And he, he welcomed me with open arms. So he really, really made my transition so much easier. And it, it, it didn't have to be that way, but it was because of the type of person that he was. I first made it to training camp. I come in from practice and I had, you know, you take off your dirty clothes and put them in a bag. So I threw it to Tom Wilkinson because I thought he was a manager, <laughs> okay? Because when you look at Wilkie, you're like, you're the quarterback? And uh, he was all about team. He was all about doing whatever it was to make the team better, even if it meant uh, him maybe losing his job one day. He was going to help me, and, and I really, really appreciated that. He was, uh, there's a picture of him carrying the Grey Cup. He's, that's right, he's carrying the Grey Cup in one hand, and he's got a toothpick in the other. And I'm watching him walk towards the bus, and that's the last time he walked towards the bus when he played for us. You know, Warren and I hung out. We, we went out to dinner the night before the Great Cup. And we were eating. And then Warren never talked about what he wanted to do or if he wanted to be the MVP of the Great Cup. But this night he said, I want, I'm going to shoot for the, uh, the MVP of the game. 
And so I looked at her and I went, damn. And I said, waiter, let me have a piece of cake and a glass of wine <laughs> because I knew I wasn't going to get the ball, but I knew I would be blocking quite a bit. So I tried to beef up my weight the day before the game. The offense, me, you know, they put on a show 32 in the last game in the rain. We had a pretty good team as far as attitude. I mean, it could snow or rain or the wind could blow and it doesn't mean we liked it, but uh, we were ready to play in it. Which I still remember Pat Marston saying, well, if it didn't rain, Toronto would have. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, we're playing in Toronto. They kept us up all night yelling Argos. We got a Toronto crowd, but uh, we have the advantage because it only rained on their side of the field. <laughs> As that game started to end and, and Warren was able to uh, kneel down, I felt like we had gone full circle in, in Warren's development. So, I just felt like Warren's ready now for the big time. It just was uh, all about team play and a lot of guys sacrificed some uh, extra fame they could have had by being the one big star, but uh, they kind of got left off of all-star teams and all of that. But we kept saying there's one prize they don't vote on and we're going after that one prize. It took a lot to play for our team because it was we were so different than everybody else. So once you started thinking nothing but team, then um, it was, the rest was a lot easier than it would normally be. Oh my God, <laughs> you, we, had, we had speed, we had smarts, we had strength, we had intelligence. I, we had leadership. What else is needed for a team to be a championship? I don't think there's anything else you need to be a championship team. We won, we won five Grey Cups in a row. I don't think anybody in any professional sport of any kind has done anything like that five times in a row in a team sport. So you don't realize how special that is until you're away from the game for a while. And then you understand, man, I was part of a team that was able to stay together long enough and win five straight championships. And it's really a special feeling to know that you were part of something like that. Things that I took, I personally took, as much pride in anything that I was lucky enough to accomplish in Edmonton was always being on that team. I never played for another team. I never could have imagined playing for another team. And it's the same with all those other guys. The thought of, of ever being somewhere else was just horrific, <laughs> like just undoable. And when I when I see these guys and have a chance to to talk to them or, or we get a chance to interact, it's almost like we never left each other. That's how close a football team we were both on and off the field. Just great, great relationships. And that's what you um, you relish most out of winning those championships. Those things will never leave you. You will always be a part of championship teams and we, we will always be a part of those five, especially that core group of guys that were together. And that'll, that'll bond us for the rest of our lives. From 86, we were in the great and we played Hamilton and we lost. It was a real goal for us to get back again. And uh, we really wanted to get back in 87. I said, you know what, guy? I've been here. Let me tell you something. You don't want to be in this locker room if we lose. You know, you don't want to be in this locker room. I want that ring. Lance Trummer, he pushed it to the right. He pushed it to the right a little bit. I know that Lima was coming down the first and he had, he didn't have an angle on me, but he tried to keep me from going outside. So what I did, I made a little step inside, and then once I got outside, I mean, we had a wall of guys. But we knew that every time he, the ball was in his hands, there was a chance that we were gonna we, we were gonna have success. And uh, I remember how he jumped over. I think it was Larry Ruck. He might have jumped over. And all of a sudden, like I'm outrunning my blocker, so I slowed down for Stanley Blair to make another block. And then Dunnis still run. I'm like Dunnis. I'm telling, go get the kicker, go get Les, you know. You know, I had the best seat in the house watching Henry run by the sidelines, knowing that nobody was going to catch him. But it was also amazing how many times he was caught by a, you know, a slow white kicker with uh, hockey shoulder pads on, and and, <laughs> and Lance Chomick got to his ankles like on the one yard line, and Henry had to fall into the end zone. And Lance did, he did catch me in the end zone. But that's one of the things I can remember in that game. That was it was a big game, and. And Matt had been knocked out of the game, and Damon came in, and we were, you know, uh, um, I, I, I don't think we were doing real well at the time, and, and Damon came in and won the game. 
and uh, or help us win the game. One of the greatest uh, moments in, I guess, breakup history was the, the Jerry Core kick at the, with 44 seconds to go in the game to win the game. And it was a 47 to 48 yard kick. You know, J Jerry Kerr, the kicker, and he go, don't worry, Giz, I got this. And I'm saying to myself, and Jerry was always cocky, you know, I'm like, Jerry, you really got this? He go, I got this. I said, you sure? He said, yeah, I got this. And, uh, but Damon had to come off of one knee to grab the ball because I, you know, I was gripping it pretty tight with the uh, pressure on, you know, and, uh, and I, I launched it a little high and grabbed the ball, put it down, Jerry Torch kicked it through. And uh, their long snapper, he was the first face I saw. As I hit him and I could see the ball go right over my head, it was going right to the goalpost. I was going, it's in, it's in, Vern, it's in. And he's going, no, it's not, no, it's not. He wouldn't look. He's just... <laughs> but we still had 40 seconds to go. And uh, they uh, they had an opportunity to come back. And I think they moved the ball up to somewhere around the midfield and, and then ultimately lost the ball on down. Um, it was an unbelievably exciting game to be a part of. We played in the Western Final. The Calgary Mountain of 47 with the win. And it was snowing. I think it was minus 27, but the wind chill took it. To, I'd heard it's as cold as minus 53 if the gusts were up to, and, and, uh, but certainly it was in the minus 40 range. Then we go back and play the 1993 Grey Cups. It's plus 15. I said, Winnipeg, y'all getting y'all ass kicked. <laughs> you know why we really wanted Winnipeg play that year too? Because Matt Donegan had destroyed us one game. That's the year Matt Donegan beat us, and he threw for 700 yards. And you know what? We, would, we remember that. We remember that. But Matt didn't play in the game. We didn't care if Matt played or not. So now we're playing against, uh, I forget who it was, was the uh, general manager's uh, son-in-law, was the quarterback. And, uh, and you know, it was a close game. They had some fantastic players on the team. Um, and to um, the point where nobody was really scoring a lot of touchdowns. And, and uh, Sean Fleming had to be really big. Like, I think he kicked seven field goals or something. Yeah, it was a, it was a tight game. And had Matt Dunnigan been there, it might have been a different story. But uh, I remember being interviewed uh, after the game, quickly coming off the field. And what do you think about the game? You know, and Sean Fleming being the top Canadian. And, and I said, well, if he wouldn't have missed that one in the early in the game, then we wouldn't have to worry about it at the end of the game. <laughs> it was, for me, because I had played in 87 and not played in 1990, and we got our butts kicked by Winnipeg. This was uh, such a big game because I, I had played the whole season and had a big part of this game. And, and I knew what personally the struggles that I'd gone through from a physical standpoint. Like I honestly thought, Alan, that after that game, that uh, I that was going to be my last game because I didn't know how my knees were going to be able to handle it. So it was it was really at the end of the game, Rod Conop and I sat out on the field um, for two hours after the, the game was over, still in our equipment. We were in the locker room, we each grabbed a bottle of champagne. I had bought some cigars earlier in the day and we went out and sat on the Calgary San Peter logo at center field and sat there and smoked our cigars and drank our, our, our champagne. And the only reason why we're still not there is the, uh, the staff at McMahon Stadium said, guys, uh, we got to lower the big speaker and you, it's right above you guys, so you guys are going to have to move. <laughs> so my son, Marcus, he just go up, hey dad, I'd like to go to the Grey Cup this year. I go, what? He go, I'd like to go to the Grey Cup this year. I said, do you know where it's at? He said, yeah. I said, it's a scatter. I said, do you know how cold it is? It was freezing. We were so jacked up. I remember I wore uh, a half shirt. That's all I had on was a half shirt and um, just a, a neck scarf. So we go to the Grey Cup game, and it's freezing. We set up on the top rail in the open state, and I go, yeah, you know, he ain't gonna stay here that long. So at halftime, we go in the bathroom. That's the warmest place in the place because everybody crowded in there. He go, okay, Dad, let's go back. Um, back then, they didn't have field turf. They had old Astro turf still. And by halftime, like, there was a sheet of ice over top of it. And we were in the locker room contemplating coming out in full cleats because it was, we had to crunch through it and break through it because guys were slipping and sliding all over the place. My son stayed out there the whole game. I mean, I froze my butt off out there. But I'm serious though, it was a great game because we won that game though. It, it was a revenge uh, uh, rematch really because we lost here in Commonwealth in front of our home fans. And I would say it was a home game really, the Grey Cup was and, and to lose the way we did um, and to have the opportunity to beat the team that beat us. You know, that, that was kind of hanging over us. We didn't perform very well offensively or defensively in that 0-2 game. Uh, we were so fired up. We just knew we had that feeling that we were going we to win this game. And then Glenn Cahoon made that one-handed catch. 
and we all just remember that Pat Woodcock made the play here, the, the big catch here, and that kind of got us down a little bit. I just remember on the sideline, it was like, not this year, not, everybody was yelling, not this year, not this year. Those, that's, that's what I remember. I'm still getting chills right now thinking about it. When I look back, I think offense. To me, in my mind, we were an offensive juggernaut that year. Tuck had an awesome game, awesome game, MVP of the game. And, you know, he made that one really great catch by the uh, stands that they had, had put up. And it was just unbelievable. Ricky Ray, you know, played a great game. Our defense was, was top notch, especially in the second half. Defensively, all we really had to do was just minimize what, what opponents did to us because we knew we could outscore anybody. They're being modest. You know, they, they held Montreal's offense to one point there in the second half. And for who they had on offense was, was pretty, that's, that's, that's a lot, that's saying a lot. So to know being in this 0-3 game that, okay, we're doing it, we're putting up points, this is who we are and we're comfortable with that, um, it just gives a lot of confidence to be able to know that we're, we're going to do this thing, no problem. To me, that 2005 game, it was, it was not only the sort of the culminating game between us and Montreal, like we really didn't like them. Like they, there was something about that team that we didn't like. We, did not, we didn't really respect them as a team. We thought we were better than them the whole time. And I remember during that game, a lot of us thinking and, and sort of playing along those lines of just like, look, we're not losing to these dudes. Like we're not going to give them the upper hand on us in, in, in the number of Grey Cup victory. I felt in, in 05, defensively, we, we really hung our hats on how tough we were going to be defensively. Um, we knew that all we had just get the ball back as many times as it takes for the offense to score, and eventually they will. You know, Ricky was on, so I, I wasn't too worried. Seeing that Ricky was seeing everything the right way, you, you were pretty confident that you were going to win the thing. We were just like, we just got to give him time. Like, if we give him time, we're going to win the game. You know, and then when you have your special teams returning kicks for touchdowns in the biggest great game of the year, it lets you know you're complete. And out of a punt return in the Grey Cup, which is kind of a cool deal as well. It was for two yards, but it was a punt return nonetheless. Uh, another thing about that year, uh, talking about Jason Moss, is I hang my hat on his approach and professionalism for that run. Ricky was our quarterback, but Jason was, you know, everybody really respected Jason. And for him to come in and, and do that, you know, it, it was it was a real galvanizing moment for us as a group, and we, we knew we could count on everybody in the in, in the huddle. We knew we could count on Jason or Ricky, whoever was going to play. Uh, the way he was in and out brought us back in both playoff games, and going into halftime of the Grey Cup, we're almost in that same situation: is do we make the switch? And Moss said, "Hey, listen, this is this is Ricky's team. I'll be here if you need me. Let him follow through." And and he did, and we came out in that second half and lit it up. Well, one of my favorite memories, and I hate to just be like, it's a personal deal, but in that, in that 2005 Grey Cup, um, right at the end of the game where it's critical to, to make a stop, it's critical to, to keep Montreal from scoring, they're, they're in that semi-field goal range, and here comes our field goal return team on, on third down. Our defense runs off, and I was on the field goal return team as well, and I look over and it's Cavillo and the entire offense getting ready to run a play and we have our field goal return team out. So at the split second, I'm thinking, okay, what do we do? We don't call timeouts. Rule number one in the CFL is there's no player who will ever call a timeout. You got one and that's the coaches. Um, so I walked up and smacked the offensive lineman, drew a five yard penalty, brought our defense back out on the field to defend their offense. Um, had we left that group out there, Anthony Cavillo would have lit us up. I have no doubt in my mind. So. Um, a penalty is a, a, usually a negative experience, but, but for me in that moment, I, I felt that that was a, one of my better plays that I've had in football. I knew that we had a, a very veteran group and we had a team that was like, we'd been through a lot that year. The journey we had took to get there, you lose your star quarterback, now you're using your bag ups. You know, it was moments where our offense couldn't even put up points. We like was totally relying on the D and they were scoring. So, I mean, we come into the game, we had like 13 points scored on us before we even got onto the field. But I looked down the sideline, and I was honestly like, we're all right. Like, I, and I, I think that that was a kind of a feeling throughout the sideline was like, we're okay. Those moments in Ottawa when they went up too, as nervous as it looked, we was confident that if we did what we needed to do, it was, it was on our side. Pat got the interception, then we came down and then, uh, we got to the end zone, scored, 
that was the moment, like I say, when D-Walt looked at me in the end zone, he said, that's all we need. That's what we needed, big bro. Because the team that we was this year, we knew that, that we just needed that. We just needed a step. And that was our step. And then we knew we could get the running. But we were like that all year. Like we were, there was never really times where we could just put it in neutral and just kind of, oh yeah, we got this. You know what I mean? Like it was, we're fighting till the end and we're going we're gonna to scrap it out and we're going to come out on top. And like, and that, that's how it kind of went all year. It was amazing with the, the different packages we was able to use, you know. I remember Jordan Lynch from when he was in college, man, the great Jordan Lynch. You know, for Coach Jones and our offense to rely on this guy, you know, in a time like that. Like, if you don't get it on third and one, like, you're you're, you're very disappointed in yourself, you're disappointed in the unit as a whole. Like, we've got Matt O'Donnell, who's, like, one of the biggest people in the CFL. We're, like, we're going to put our head down, we're going to get behind him and Justin, and we're going we're gonna to go. The moment of the game, the, the what we need done, and he, we hear the play called in, or signaled in. We were signaling plays at the time. And we all kind of laughed like, what? Mike was even like, what? The handoff to AD? I was like, what? You know what I mean? And uh, it worked. You know what I mean? It worked. In my head, I knew I had a bunch of plays that could happen that game. That was like at the bottom. I don't. Even, in my head, I didn't even put it on there. Because I'm like, and it ended up being, the, you know, the last play of the game. But the most memorable play was that one. You know what I'm saying? For me, being everything that happened before leading up to that, I mean, the competition, the touchdown, the coming back, but to end the game with that feeling, like I say, it was it was pretty cool. You know, I, I once again I say thanks to Coach Mac, Jerry, Coach Coach Jones. You know, because see at the end of call that play was kind of cool to me. And uh, I think the rest was history after that.